Boy, what a beautiful crystal clear night here in October. The Milky Way, planets Jupiter, Saturn beaming so bright. And I'm so glad that you're with us to stay curious as my planet sphere falls apart here. I'm Mark Marquette, Stargazer Mark, here at the American Space Museum, where we're keeping you star curious today with some backyard astronomy, some good tips about seeing the planets Jupiter and Saturn and some constellations that you all know real well. Uh, in these autumn times here in North America, it's a beautiful time to stargaze. October and November are traditionally the clearest nights with less turbulence in the atmosphere, there are not as many storms going on, so you can have four or five good nights without the moon out. We're, we're, the moon's not a dirty four-letter word, but we do uh, don't like it when it drowns out the Milky Way. Like's behind me here. This is a tree right there and the Milky Way skirting above it. Photographed this last night out at the Herky Huffman uh, Bull Creek Wildlife Preserve west of Melbourne. That'd be southwest of uh, or east of Orlando between Melbourne, Florida and Orlando. Pretty dark out there. It's a hunter's paradise. They hunt deer and, and turkey and wild boar out there and uh, they're familiar with the stargazers out there so I gave it a try wanted to see the Milky Way one good time before the moon is coming up this next week you'll see the crescent moon in the sky and then the moonlight as it approaches full phase washes out all but the brightest stars so we're going to look at some of the constellations as I photographed them last night and uh, look at Jupiter uh, and particularly Saturn on this segment of Stay Star Curious here on Stay Curious. So let's uh, let me get my got my binoculars out. Binoculars are one of the best ways to learn the sky. These nights of our crisp, clear autumn nights are made to lay in a in a lawn chair. Let your eyes get good and dark adapted. I left my red flashlight over on my desk over there. But a red flashlight allows you to see your labels uh, and and uh, read star charts and other things on there. Marty Winkle, my co-producer, he's looking for it. Uh, my red flashlight. I must have carried it with me somewhere else, Marty. But I do have my refreshments with me, a little coffee. Got me some key lime popcorn here. And uh, once you get outside as I eat in front of you. It's good to, to want to stay outside, not go back in because your eyes will then contract back to small pupils and you want to get your eyes nice and dilated, get used to the night sky, the sounds as you get immerse yourself in the, the heavens above. You kind of get into it, meaning that like you don't want to leave. You want to keep outlining these constellations and Maybe you're going to see an airplane. That's what's above my head here is an airplane with its lights blinking uh, going over to Orlando Airport. That one, I'm sure. So we'll talk about a little bit about some practical stargazing here in a few minutes. But Marty Winkle, we've got a couple things to take care of for our museum. One Saturday, November 5th, we're going to have a space memorabilia show from 9 to 5 at the Holiday Inn Exit 95 in Titusville. We want to raise $5,000 for our gallery improvements to upgrade the cases and buy some things that Nick Enix, our collection manager, and Karen Conklin, our executive director, have been had on their uh, wish list. So this is what these memorabilia shows are going to be about. We're going to do one in the fall and one in the spring. Uh, $30 a table. If you want to rent a table, contact me, M-A-R-Q, at americanspacemuseum.org. We are going to have a special one-hour, 12-item auction starting at 4 o'clock where Chuck Jeffrey, owner of Bid Again Auctions, is going to give uh, conduct an auction that will have 12 wonderful items that could raise the $5,000 for our galleries all by themselves. So free admission. We're going to ask for a donation at the door and uh, should be a lot of fun and free appraisals. Chuck Jeffrey and Ken Havocott and Ken actually tutored Chuck Jeffrey. Ken is the 50-year expert in space memorabilia, 
and so you can come and bring some, your your book of autographs uh, of astronaut autographs bring whatever you got free appraisals there at the american space museum memorabilia show a week from friday and uh, we think, Marty, I think we'll probably broadcast on Facebook Live off my phone the auction when it, as it goes on. We don't want to take all of our equipment with us, but I might do it that way. What do you think? Well, you, first you said a week from Friday. Don't you mean a week from Saturday? Saturday. I said That's Friday is my error. I need some more coffee, I guess. So, And it says Saturday up there, November 5th, so... Well, we've got a birthday, Marty, and you know this man because he was the first pilot of the Lunar Module Number 3, LM3, which they call Gumdrop. And this is Rusty Schweikert. Happy 87th birthday to Apollo 9's Rusty Schweikert. Spider. Schweikert. Spider. What? Spider. Oh, it's called you call Spider. Gumdrop. Oh, oh, Gumdrop, Gumdrop was, was the command, command module. module. Okay, okay, Spider was the lunar module. That's right. Rusty Lewis uh, Schweikert, uh, Russell Lewis Schweikert was born October 25th, 1935 in Neptune Township, New Jersey. He grew up on a hard scrapple farm of 45 acres. So he was baling hay and all kinds of vegetables, raising cattle and uh, uh, lots of chickens on his farm, he said. He was selected as an astronaut in 1963, was the lunar module pilot in March 69 of the Apollo 9 mission. His commander, Jim McDivitt, just passed away last week. And David Scott is still alive. David Scott, I think, is 90 years old and Schweikert's 87. Um, they tested the lunar module in Earth orbit. It performed flawlessly. They even did things like test the descent motor if they could use it to maneuver in orbit with, which was what saved Apollo 13, the descent motor uh, looped them around the moon. So active in retirement, Marty, you've met uh, Rusty uh, quite a few times. Uh, got a, Here's why they call him Rusty, folks. <laughs> okay, he's red hair there. Uh, share that story you, you uh, uh, heard on a checkout one day with me and, and the rest, rest of our Stay Curious, curious friends. Friend. Look, it was during a test, and I was on, on the electrical power distribution console, and they were asking Rusty and Jim McDivitt what they wanted for lunch. And I forget what Jim asked for or anybody else, but Rusty said, I'll have an eight-foot redhead. <laughs> and somebody came online after that and said, hey, there's some women on the net. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that, that's a good memory there, Marty. And like we said, Marty worked on the lunar module as a lead electrical engineer and was in all those ascent stages that crashed into the lunar surface. One's orbiting the Earth, though, and orbiting the solar system, orbiting the sun. Yeah, Marty. I remember that story, but I saw Rusty years later, and they asked him if he remembered that. He said no. I said, well, that's what you actually said. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty... Um, Come to a lot of your reunions for the Grumman uh, astronauts. Um, he was one of the first astronauts to suffer from space adaption syndrome, okay? And uh, it changed their EVA schedule because he got space sickness the first day. And they were supposed to do an EVA, and they uh, he felt a little puny for a few days, I understand. Backup commander of the first crewed Skylab, but he never flew again. And... Um, uh, he's one of those astronauts, Marty, you just wonder why didn't he fly again? They all got a good excuse for it, but uh, it doesn't have to do with they were scared or training or anything. They seems like they wanted to segue into the um, commercial business where there was a lot more money and a hell of a lot less risk. But he never did fly again, but yet he's a very active uh, speaker and, and uh, is involved in uh, a lot of the Apollo era stuff, and not many of them left at age 87. I think we have, uh, Nick Thomas was saying, I think half of the Apollo era astronauts are alive now, and, and the youngest are, he's one of the young ones there, Rusty, at age 87. So, all right. Well, good, happy birthday to him, and uh, hope to see him someday. All right, well, here's a Milky Way photograph from... Um, 
that I wanted to dwell on just a second there. Uh, this is the Milky Way looking south last night from a, uh, a wild, it's not a wildlife preserve, it's actually a hunter, hunter's preserve uh, called Herfy, Herky Huffman Bull Creek uh, Wildlife Management Center. And it's uh, west of, I mean, east of, uh, no, I'm sorry, west from Melbourne area. And pretty dark skies. What we're looking at there is the heart of the Milky Way. Uh, you're going to see a few satellites and some uh, airplanes in there. And the curve on the left, Marty, with those that's four dashes of yellow light. Think about that for a minute before I tell you what those are. Someone had a comment? Yeah, uh, William Whiting wants to know, uh, is the National Wildlife Preserve on Merritt Island, how, how is the National Wildlife Preserve at, on Merritt Island for stargazing? Well, thank you, William Whiting. Uh, the National Wildlife Preserve uh, north of uh, Kennedy Visitors Complex in Cape Canaveral and all that is, uh, it's okay. It's, it's pretty decent. There's nowhere in Florida that's going to even, you know, you're, under an illusion if you think you're going to find real dark skies for stargazing in Florida. But uh, like I spent 35 years in the mountains of Tennessee and North Carolina and Virginia, there's some dark skies up there. But uh, it's good enough in, to the northeast. It's not very good, of course, to the south because you got the, the, the complex of the Space Center. But uh, and to the east is Orlando, west is Orlando. So uh, to the east and northeast is good looking over the ocean. Uh, you can see things rising coming up. Uh, this is particularly a good spot uh, where I was at last night because you got a good southern and, and northern horizon with not much light pollution that you're going to see in this picture here. But uh, planets in the moon you can watch in a Walmart parking lot. Okay. You don't have to have dark skies to see uh, the rings of Saturn, the moons of Jupiter, and craters on the moon. Uh, but to see this, the nebula, the galaxies, and the intricate uh, faint fuzzies, we call them, the galaxies through our telescope, you need a better, darker sight. And uh, here's what I'm talking about, William Whiting, is this is a view of the uh, looking east, directly east towards the ocean. I'm probably about 40 miles from the Atlantic Ocean and Melbourne Beach. And uh, it looks kind of innocuous to you there. Like, Mark, what is what is to get excited about looking at this picture, okay? Well, I'm going to tell you what's getting excited about. Up at the upper right-hand corner above my head, that bright star is the planet Jupiter. We have in this picture a satellite crossing. That is the streak up at the top left. You have the red dashes of an airplane blinking. And then you got those, Marty, we got green lights again, green flashes. What is this? Is this some some alien light source that's been fo that's following me out there? No, it's not. In fact, I labeled. Here's what we're looking at here. This is that very sky that we're looking at right there. Okay. So first, the green lights are a firefly that's about 10 feet away from me and blinked on, on, on in this 15-second exposure, all right? Taking pictures like this is a lot of fun. I had a tripod. I put my ISO at about 4,000. The camera goes to 6,000. If you got one or two or 3,000 ISO, that's the sensitivity. The higher the number the more sensitive it is to light, the shorter exposure you get. You can get away with about a, a, a 30 second exposure without the earth moving enough to trail the stars, believe it or not. Uh, you can try a minute and you'll get a little star trail. But here we have the outline of the constellations. There's the fireflies at the bottom. The big square, let's start at the top. The square is the square of Pegasus, the horse. And coming off the Pegasus, the horse is the Andromeda, uh, maiden, chain maiden, okay? Marty, would you use your circle and circle M31, the galaxy? Yes, I, I recorded the furthest object that you can see with your naked eye. That's an airplane right there. That line there is an airplane. Go go to the left, exactly left, M, M31 galaxy. 
Right there in the middle is a little faint fuzzy, and that is 2.2 million light years away. That's the Andromeda galaxy. You've seen pictures of it uh, all over the place. It's a little bit tilted, and uh, you can see with your naked eye. Uh, and this this uh, light polluted sky looking to the east is the Melbourne lights there. All right, I can see the double cluster. You see the W on the left there. That is Cassiopeia, the queen, and she's like sitting in a chair. That's supposed to be her chair, but it looks like a W or M. And at the far left hand corner is Polaris, the North Star. Now there's Jupiter on the far right. And it is in Pisces, a very indistinct constellation that is basically two fish on a hook, on, 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 two, on two lines. The circlet above Jupiter to the left is a group of stars that make a circle, and they call that the circlet. That's sort of the head of one of the fish. And then where the airplane is, is the head of the other fish there. So I label a couple things there. That's a satellite that's going through Pegasus, all right? I know that because it's not blinking. The blinking of an airplane gives it away. Red light, green light, and white light. A satellite's going to go very steady in the same direction. And it might brighten up given uh, it catching sunlight on its solar panels. Is is why a satellite is illuminated. It's sunlight bouncing off the metal of it. So, so but... I hope I hope it interests you. Well, let me go back here. Up, 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 back, back, back. Well, up, there we go. Let me go back to show you that out of this picture, all right, I can see all of this. And these are well-known constellations: the square Pegasus, the horse. See where the V of Andromeda? That's her head. That's the chain maiden. Her mom is Cassiopeia, the W on the left. I didn't label Cassiopeia, but that's her mom. And see where the point is on the, the square Pegasus, Marty? Uh, circle that, where, where Andromeda and Pegasus meet. Uh, is uh, They share that star. No, that's the nose of uh, the Pegasus, the horse. He's flying upside down, a little bit lower. There, that corner right there, that right there in the center, that corner of Pegasus, it shares a star with Andromeda, and that star is called Alpharats. All right, does that sound familiar to any of you rock and rollers out there? I'll meet you on Alpharats. That's a Mick Jagger line from 2000 Light Years from Home, a song on their sort of Sergeant Pepper or the Beatles equivalent called Satanic Majesty's Request. Uh, and that is um, Meet You on Alpha Rats is what Mick Jagger says in that song. Uh, it's so very lonely, year 2000, light years from home. Though that star is a lot closer than that, I think. So, But the fireflies on the bottom are fun to capture. And uh, astrophotography like this can be very revealing. Uh, so here's another picture of the of the sky looking east again, but a little north uh, southeast, and uh, this captures the planet Saturn. And there is Saturn. Uh, uh, I should have made that. Uh, uh, Saturn is right there in the middle, lower left. Okay, I should have made that bigger. I got my fonts messed up here. Saturn is right there, Marty. Yep, Saturn's right there. That's that's Jupiter, okay, and Saturn's right here. So they're fairly close to each other in the sky. Again, you see the Pisces, the fish, and the circlet above. Well, uh, Saturn is in Capricorn, and it doesn't look like anything. It doesn't look like a Capricorn. It doesn't look like a half man, half goat. Uh, it just looks like a bunch of faint stars, as does Aquarius, that kind of vase-looking object uh, in the center there. Uh, though they're constellations of the zodiac, they don't have very bright stars in them. And up at the upper right hand is Altair and Aquila the Eagle. So but this is to show you how close Jupiter and Saturn are to each other in the sky. And Jupiter's definitely a lot brighter, and it's always brighter than Saturn, all right? So uh, let's first feature Saturn in how it would look in a telescope uh, in your backyard. 
Uh, this is a six inch reflector, maybe a, a two or three inch refractor. It has the lens at the end, like the binoculars. Remember, half a binocular is a refractor, refracts the light, okay? Half a binocular. The mirror kind is the reflector. Galileo popularized the refractor. That's half of a binocular, all right, with the lens on the end. Newton invented the reflector that has the mirror that reflects light and to another mirror that shoots that light out either the side or back through the, the bottom of the telescope. And then he put lenses on there to magnify them. All right, we'll go. Ju but see Jupiter, and you'll just see the tiny disk of it and the stripes of the cloud tops. Jupiter is so huge, every planet could fit inside of it. If the Earth was the size of a nickel, Jupiter is the size of a basketball. All right. And uh, and then Saturn is the size of, of a volleyball that would fit inside of a basketball type of thing. So both are very large planets. These moons, you can watch them move back and forth throughout the night. There's an app for that to tell you which one it is. We'll talk about those moons in a second. There's another typical picture, uh, uh, view of, of Jupiter. You're going, it's so big, but it's not big in my telescope. Well, it's 650 million miles away, for starters. So far away that the light we're seeing reflecting off of it on your eye left Jupiter like 20 minutes ago. Here's another beautiful picture uh, of Jupiter by one of my amateur astronomy buddies. There you can see some detail on the cloud tops, including the oval of the Great Red Spot. The Great Red Spot is a storm that you can see in your telescope that's been continuously going on since we put telescopes on Jupiter. Uh, and we could see the details like this in the late 1600s. Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter in 1609 is when he first saw them from his backyard in Tuscany. Now you can look at the moons here and they're not points of light. In fact, they, they got globes of their own because they are big. They're, these moons of Jupiter are worlds of their own. In fact, Io in the upper left is uh, about the size of Earth's moon and it has over 200 volcanoes of sulfuric uh, uh, sulfur coming out of these volcanoes. It looks like a, a pizza pie, a cheese pizza, basically. Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede are all covered with ice. These are low-resolution photos of it taken by the Hubble telescope, all right, the, or high resolution. This is the best we could see with the Hubble, and we had the space probe Galileo uh, orbited Jupiter for over 10 years, and it gave us good close-ups. All these little white areas you see on Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede are uh, crater impacts on them. But you can see them as tiny moons like that, uh, overexposing the Jupiter to get the moons. And sometimes they pass behind Jupiter, sometimes in front of it, and leave shadows. Uh, and that's fun to see. And there's an application that you can get to predict all that. Here's my friend George Fleener over in uh, uh, Bradenton, Tampa Bay area. Typical backyard, uh, high-tech computer uh, digital camera situation. 10-inch telescope, all right. Uh, not, not that big of a mirror. It's not that big of a telescope, but it's the optics quality as well as the software used as to get a picture like this, an amateur astronomer in their backyard would take a short movie because uh, a movie is just uh, 10,000 frames of, of, of one thing. And uh, you put that through a computer program and it throws out the, the faint ones and the autofocus ones. And then it stacks hundreds of the good ones together to give you a wonderful picture like this. Again, we're looking at cloud tops, 200 below zero. Uh, and there is some undulating to them. Some of these clouds are lower. The darker areas are closer into the planet. The lighter areas are, are higher up. And you can sketch these objects uh, as the best you can. This is a sketch I made. I'm not professing it's a great work of art, but this is how I saw Jupiter through a pretty good-sized telescope 
last year. Uh, the red spot and the red, the black dot is the shadow of one of the moons that's off to the right. And the shadow of that moon hits Jupiter in over an hour or so. It went from right to left. And you can see the whirls, the details. Uh, it's fun to sketch and try to capture it. And there, there's an impression from the Juno satellite that is orbiting Jupiter as we speak. Juno is a NASA satellite that goes down to about 6,000 miles above the cloud tops and then goes out to a million miles away. Well, the intense radiation of Jupiter's uh, environment around it, it has a hellish radiation system. It's actually heated up around Jupiter. Uh, and the speed that the giant Jupiter is pulling that spacecraft Juno has made it a very special spacecraft that's making some wonderful discoveries like looking at the North and South Poles. Look at this, Marty. Jupiter is like looking at a Van Gogh painting. It's like you can't even paint like this. All right. It is so intricate and so beautiful and layered. And uh, we don't know a lot about really why this planet uh, looks the way it does. Uh, it's very colorful. Saturn doesn't have these color type patterns, nor does Neptune and Jupiter. I mean, Neptune and Uranus, the, the other two giant planets that are covered in a globe of uh, below zero hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, ammonia, all kinds of uh, compounds that come from nitrogen and mix in hydrogen. Well, we look back in the sky uh, and uh, uh, Saturn, uh, as I showed you, is, is almost directly south when it gets dark out. And here you see Saturn. I'm, I'm trying to prepare you that when you look through a telescope in astronomy club and hope you find one to look through this fall, you're going to be a little underwhelmed when you see how tiny Saturn is. But then as you keep looking at it, you realize it gets bigger in your mind's eye and you start absorbing some of the detail. And that's a fairly small telescope. And then a, 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 another size telescope with other magnification. This is a, a photograph I took years ago to show you. You can see it big, but not so much detail. All right, that's the compromise when you enlarge an object in a telescope with a higher eyepiece power, you lose some resolution there. But there's a better look at that through a, a, a better telescope. So... This, that's a difference of uh, film. All right, that's actually photographed on film in a digital image. Pretty much the same. A uh, very good photograph from a, a, a backyard telescope that uh, is semi-professional. You see the rings have a division in the middle. An astronomer named Cassini saw that division. Galileo saw Jupiter. He didn't distinguish the rings. He thought that the planet had like ears on the side of it because he looked at it not even as good as that. All right. He couldn't see the gaps between the planet and the rings. These rings are just phenomenal. All right. And I can never tire of seeing them in a telescope. But they tilt as the Earth moves around the, the orbit of the sun. And Jupiter is also in a 30-year orbit around the sun. Uh, the rings from our perspective actually tilt because uh, we're looking above them and below them from our perspective, depending on where the two planets are in their orbits. So uh, about 30 years ago, the rings actually disappeared. You couldn't hardly see them in the upper photograph like that. Again, we sent a spacecraft called Cassini to Jupiter, I mean to Saturn, and it studied the planet like Galileo studied Jupiter for about a decade. If you are bored and want to be entertained, go to Jet Propulsion Lab Cassini Images, and you're going to be blown away by some of the most amazing photography ever. Here are the rings. They are like a sheet of phonographic vinyl record in the grooves of it. The difference in the colors and difference in spacing is caused by different particles. The 
part above my head has a lot more ice on these smaller particles than the ones that are in the middle there. And then you see towards as you go towards Saturn how brightly lit some of those areas are. And these areas of grooves that you see, particularly in the center there, Marty, with the three black grooves in that darker circle of, of the ring, those are cleared out by moonlets. We're going to see some pictures of moonlets that are trapped inside of the of the the rings. Most of the ring material is the size of sand or gravel. Imagine a gravel out in the yard or uh, nothing is bigger than a softball or baseball, let's say. All right. Where did it come from? We don't know. How long have these rings been there? We don't know. Have they been there for a million years or a hundred thousand years? Now, this is one of the most outstanding photographs I've ever seen, Marty. The spacecraft is actually looking down on the rings. And see at the top a, 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 where you see the shadow of that ridge being cast on the other rings? That ridge is no more than 500 feet tall. All right. In fact, at no point are the rings thicker than a quarter of a mile. All right. 1,250 feet is the thickness of these rings. That is incredible. Not a mile thick, not five miles thick, the thickness of about a quarter of a mile. And this edge is being lifted up in, in, in by a, uh, a moon that orbits outside the ring system. So much like iron filings from a magnet, if you put a magnet and, and moved it over some iron filings, they jump up at you. This is what's going on here on a grander scale. This is a moon above my head right there that is inside of one of the rings and it's making a scallop. This moon is less than a mile in diameter. And look at what gravity does, folks. The, the mystery of gravity and how it affects other objects near it is like a wave going through an ocean and creating a, a uh, uh, a resonance there. So beautiful, so striking. We need to know so much more about this. Here are some of these shepherd moons, they call them, that are tiny moons under a mile in diameter that keep these rings in check. If we could live another 100,000 years and look back at, at Saturn, would the rings be there? We don't know for sure, Marty, if they'd be there or not. We, we have no way of really knowing what happened to create these rings. Now, Jupiter's got some ropey type rings around them, like a hula hoop. Uranus has got some rings around them that are ring fragments. Some of them don't go all the way around their arcs. And Neptune also has some lumpy rings and sections of them in there. But uh, we don't know if the Earth had a ring at one time. And we do know this, that when a moon or a body is big enough and gets close enough to a planet at a limited area called the Roche limit, R-O-C-H-E, that gravity can rip it to shreds. And so it's suspected that planets like, uh, or small moons like Pandora and uh, Epimetheus and uh, Daphnis and Pan there and Atlas, uh, maybe they are being pulled in closer and will be ripped to shreds by the gravity and then add to the uh, thickness of the ring there. Or maybe the rings will just dissolve. Here's one of the most incredible things about these rings, Marty. That uh, And here's these other moons. Another close-up of the moons there. Well, that's back. Forward. Here's what some of these moons look like. They're not round moons. They're flat. Some of them are like pancakes, okay? Uh, Prometheus is long there, all right? And uh, there we have uh, Jupiter up there in the upper left-hand corner. I mean, Saturn, I'm sorry, Saturn there. And as we look at Jupiter and Saturn together uh, uh, um, in a collage there by friend Derek Demeter, I want to remind you about these rings again. And uh, glad that Doug Forrest is getting a little astronomy today on his lunch hour, as is Mark Usiak, Umberto. Glad that you're here with us, sir. Carlton uh, Bailey and Daniel DeYoung. Ben Husett, thank you for watching, Ben. Tammy McDougal Miller, McCougal Miller. Uh, and Melissa Pope at the Office of Tourism. Tom Usiak and 
and we're uh, William Whiting. You all get used to your fall nights up there. You got some great crisp weather up there in Michigan and Pennsylvania. Get outside and, and enjoy some of the crisp air and look at the stars. Take a star chart with you so you can identify the stars uh, up there in, uh, in your backyard. Uh, one note about these fabulous rings of wonderful Jupiter, I mean Saturn. And here's a picture that was taken by Cassini looking back with the sun uh, uh, backlighting the rings. And it was amazing to see the Earth. Look at the Earth and Moon there, Marty. That is the Earth and Moon below there, Venus and Mars, all right? So this is about a billion miles away, and there we are, just a little moat, a little speck of light broadcasting here in the American Space Museum Studios, Marty, 10 miles from Kennedy Space Center, and we're just a little moat there, just a little. And look at this other ring and ring system that we can't see from Earth or, or uh, we've never seen before. It's backlighting, this scattered light. So there's a lot of faint and a lot of smoky type debris around, around uh, Saturn there. But think of this as we look at these incredible rings. They extend from the Earth to the moon, 200,000 miles from one end to the other, all right? And I told you, at no point are they more than a quarter mile thick, Marty. 200,000 miles wide and a quarter mile thick. That is a ratio of this sheet of paper, 20 miles wide. A sheet of regular paper, 20 miles wide, 20 miles, Marty, is what these rings are. Held together by all those moons, and there's over 60 moons of Jupiter, of Saturn, all right, including one of the largest moons of the solar system, Titan, that you can see in a backyard telescope as a star. There you see the aurora on, on Jupiter, I mean, on keep calling it Jupiter, on Saturn there. But those rings are like a 20-mile wide sheet of paper, all right, that's the thickness of them there. Incredible, isn't it? Well, we're glad that you spent some time with us today to stay star curious from our backyard here at the American Space Museum and hope that you get out in your backyard to enjoy some star shine uh, out there. Uh, let me see if I've got any notes here. I got a note on an eight-foot redhead, Marty. Uh, we covered Alpharats, um, and we want to remind you all that we want you to stay curious tomorrow as Shuttle Payload Manager Mikey Haddad is doing a program on STS-41G, a 1984 space shuttle flight that, of Challenger that um, uh, had some, some really breakthrough science on it of... Uh, in, in, in the payload bay, uh, they refueled hydrazine and did some other things like that. And Mikey's going to have a guest with us, Damien. Um, and Damien will be uh, with him here, another um, level four engineer on the space shuttle to talk about the payloads of the space shuttle for the month, month of October. So, Marty, thank you for a good job today. Uh, we got anything else to uh, share with our friends? As I'm, I'm eating some key lime popcorn. Mm. I, I've just been thinking, and it may be a silly question, but the small, what you call the small moons around Saturn look kind of like a meteor. So if the meteor, if, if this, in this case, if Saturn captures that meteor and it's in orbit, does that make it a moon? Yes, it does. Very good question, Marty. These objects are small. They, uh, a meteor that size of some of these small Saturn moons, yet yeah, some are only a half a mile wide, coming in the Earth's atmosphere is going to, if it reached the surface, could, you know, create a, uh, a global warming. Uh, that, those aren't that big, but you need something about two, three miles to do that. But yes, you're absolutely right. Any space debris that's captured by another planet or another moon. Asteroids have moonlets going around them. We discovered that. And if these 
uh, small moons of Saturn would get tossed out. They could get captured by another more massive body, start orbiting them. Yes, they become a satellite. Instead of cosmic debris, they're satellites. So absolutely right. Okay, so the, the small moons cause the gap between the rings. You know, you got that black area, they're inside that. Yes. So those small moons cause that, what I'll call the black area. Yes, yes, they actually do. I'll go to that since Marty's asking about that. They actually clear out. Here, here's, here's what you're talking about. See how that has actually cleared that area out. All right. Now, it could be above or below it. Where's these other moons? So, uh, I guess, let me go this way. And you see these other moons that we're talking about right there. Some are outside of that little ropey ring called the F ring. They, of course, labeled these rings. The A ring's the brightest. A, B, and C. Uh, Atlas is inside of the A ring there at the top. Uh, Pan is inside of the A ring, and you see where it's cleared out that area. All right, literally, how is it cleared out the area? Well, like a magnet attracting a negative force, it could just toss it out. And it could be tossed inward, out, or, or out into space. Uh, or it could be attracted to it and clump to the small satellite and make it bigger. You're not going to see these with your backyard telescope. We can see two or three of Saturn's larger moons with a backyard telescope. Okay, so a follow-up question. And were they at one time, you think they were meteors at one time that cleared out that black area? Or did, did the black area cause those small moons? Or no, they, 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 were, they, were, they were planetoids or meteors, if you want to call them. Actually, they'd be meteoroids. All right. Meteoroids are when they're floating in space. Meteors, when we see it streaking in an atmosphere, Earth or Mars. We've seen meteors on Mars from our landers. And uh, a meteorite when it's on the ground and in your hand. So it's cosmic debris. And until they're captured, if uh, there are objects like these moons from a half a mile to a mile to two miles that are just floating, orbiting randomly in our entire solar system. Where did they come from? From other collisions of larger bodies, and they've chipped off from those, all right? Because the universe, our, our solar system at four and a half billion years old, uh, in the early days, the first half a billion years, things were running into each other and clumping together, all right? And there's not enough stuff to clump, uh, and... Uh, uh, it, it, it could happen with some comet material or things really merge slowly together. But basically, the violence of the beginning of our solar system is continuing with less density of objects than we had three billion years ago. When you look at the moon, and there's the evidence, the cratered moon, most of those craters impacted the moon three billion years ago. And the more fresher looking ones, obviously, uh, or more recently. So good questions, Marty. The universe, I mean, our solar system is filled with lots of debris. Our Earth picks up 10 tons of cosmic debris, not every year, every day. 20,000 pounds of space dust lands on the Earth. Now, why doesn't that filter and burn up in the atmosphere? Well, that's the stuff that burns up in the atmosphere. It's sort of like the ashes and the smaller particles come back down like dust motes. So, uh, yeah, good questions. Very interesting to think about. Uh, but this is how these dark areas get cleared out. It's like um, uh, you think about going on the highway and, uh, you know, you get in the fast lane and go ahead of everybody else. You're kind of clearing out the lane. That's sort of how, how, how that works. But it's all about gravity. Think about those experiments in school where you had two magnets you had a, a, a positive and a negative, and if you put the positive and negative together, they click together. But if you put the negative and negative together, you can't. And it's so much fun to play with a magnet, you can't put them together negative to negative or positive to positive. It's like there's an invisible bearing uh, that, that stops you from doing that. Well, that's how things get repelled out of the plane of this uh, ring system. Again, 200, right there is 100,000 miles wide, just one side of the ring, 
and yet it's only a quarter of a mile thick, an incredible ratio. Marty, thank you for your interest there. Any other questions from our friends? Well, we hope that you can all visit us tomorrow when we have Mikey Haddad here to talk about a payload of a 1984 shuttle flight. And we got one more question before I go out. Yeah, Larry Puskar is asking, does Saturn and Jupiter protect the Earth? Do they what the Earth? Protect. Protect the Earth. Good question, Larry Puskar. Yes, uh, we would be hit with uh, on a more frequent basis with larger asteroids if Jupiter was not taking hits for us. It's taking hits for the inner solar system all the time. And as amateur astronomers keep their telescopes 24-7 on Jupiter around the world, we have seen some of these impacts in the last few years where something the size of a mile, like one of those small moons of Saturn we were looking at, is sucked into Jupiter. And we've actually seen the bright flash as it, it hits the, the cloud tops. So uh, Jupiter is protecting us more than Saturn is. Uh, Saturn's a billion miles away. Jupiter's about 600 million miles away. But yes, things are drawn to it. In fact, the uh, spacecraft Lucy was launched to investigate a swarm of space debris that is in the orbit of Jupiter ahead of it, and then it's going to go over to the uh, st stuff behind it. This is the nature of gravity, where Jupiter's collected all this space debris. It's stuck in its orbit, and it's pushing it ahead, and it's pulling it behind it there. So it has taken a lot of hits for us. Now, we saw an astronaut talk today, Marty, that talked about the Earth's atmosphere, where these meteors and space debris build, uh, uh, meteoroids burn up, if the Earth is a basketball, all right, that uh, Earth's atmosphere around it is like a quarter inch thick, all right? It's nothing, folks, compared to what you think it is. Very small is our Earth's atmosphere, the, the blue uh, fragile line that is the only border we should concern ourselves with, so... Thank you for your questions, guys, and your interest in stargazing. Get out in your own backyard. Get you some snacks. Uh, the uh, key lime, key lime uh, popcorn is pretty good, Marty. I'll share it with you after the show here. Get you something to drink. Stay outside. Get your eyes adapted and enjoy some a meteor or two. You're always going to see some satellites. Airplanes are fun to watch. But what you're doing is you're staying curious, and I'm glad to help you along the way. So until tomorrow when we have Mikey Haddad with payloads of the space shuttle, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.